Imisham Toli Hakam, the editor and curator to elevate issues of life. I'm very excited on the occasion of Earth Day to have three experts about food and the environmental movement. Today we have with us who's an award-winning author, an academic, and a professor at UT Austin uh, at the Linda B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, director of grant making and advocacy. Global North around the color, and in particular with us, um, Professor Phil Veriano, who is an internationally renowned GMO activist, lawyer, and organizer, and has been uh, for uh, about three decades and one of the drafters of the car. Safety. So I want to get to it because I know that we're covering. A really uh, uh, broad uh, view is to sort of link food issues to the environmental movement. And I'd like to first begin with certain definitions and advice. We've heard about food justice, food security, and food sovereignty. We hear them used interchangeably. Are there any differences? And do any of these differences have any relevance to the environmental movement? Um, well, uh, Shamdali, I'm sorry, I, I can't couldn't hear completely what, what the question was, but I'm, I'm thinking that it's it's around the differences between food security, food justice, and food sovereignty, and so. Uh, just to give us instant potted history, uh, the the idea of food sovereignty emerges in the, the 1990s, coming from a social movement called La Via Campesina, and what they're doing is saying, look, we are uh, we, we understand that food security is it emerges from neoliberalism. Food security is the idea that you can have access to enough food for a, a healthy life, um, but the problem with food security is that you can be food secure in prison. Uh, and the idea of, of food security is, yeah, sure, I mean, if you're in prison, if, if you have a warder who is uh, benevolent enough, you'll get your, uh, you know, your, your resources and be able to live a, a healthy, active life, but you'll still be in prison. You have no say over how it is that food gets to you. Um, you have very little control over that. And uh, the, the, the idea of food sovereignty is... Well, actually, what we need is control over the policy-making process, because otherwise we'll never actually get to food security. Uh, and so the, the idea that Via Campesina had is to say, look, neoliberalism actually prevents us from achieving uh, a, a condition where everyone gets to eat and the right to food is achieved, because we are being locked out of the policy-making process. It's being uh, turned into a neoliberal game. Uh, so certainly there's a huge distinction between food sovereignty and food security. Food security is the outcome, and La Via Campesina says, look, if, you, if you're serious about achieving food security, then neoliberalism isn't going to do it for you, because neoliberalism distributes food on the basis of ability to pay, and the ability to pay is no basis for achieving uh, what ought to be a right. Uh, so there, there's, there's a world of a difference between food security and food sovereignty. Food justice uh, is a term that, that, that's particularly pre prevalent in the United States, and it has a different kind of genealogy. Uh, the genealogy in the United States is uh, more akin to the idea of uh, histories of the environmental movement. The environmental movement uh, was often concerned, and, and in, many, uh, in some places today still is concerned, with preserving uh, an environment without people, and particularly without people of color, on it. Uh, and the environmental justice movement uh, emerged uh, really in response to a, 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 essentially a racist environmental movement through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, w s pointing out that some of the worst environmental problems in the United States were often in areas where uh, people of color and poor people were living. And so the environmental justice movement sticks on the, the idea of justice and 
uh, a remedy to historical inequality uh, as a way of reminding people that if you really are serious about these in uh, ideas about environmentalism, that you, you really want to come at it with a framework of justice. Food justice is about the same thing. Uh, it's, it's about reminding us that certainly in the United States, uh, we, we live uh, amid histories of deep inequality, and uh, those need to be addressed if we are to uh, achieve the idea of food security for everyone. But I do think that there's, there's kind of a confluence, even though La Via Campesina is a peasant movement in large part, uh, driving ideas of food sovereignty, and food justice is, is a movement uh, that comes from urban roots. I think that they move towards the same kinds of ideas around needing to be in control of the process uh, of being very concerned with equality, particularly gender equality, uh, and understanding that food security, this idea that everyone gets to eat, is something that is an outcome uh, after a, a long process of struggle. So they're both the issues of food justice and food sovereignty connect us to an examination of environmental sort of saying and being able to control the production. Because you talked about the economy, but if you can talk a little bit about how to, um, these notions of democracy, which I put on the Facebook uh, event page, about it, these are about democratic questions of controlling sort of the production as well. So I'm just wondering if you connect both the, the justice and sovereignty terms to issues about production and in terms of the environmental movement. Like, I mean, I hope you're here being able to hear I am, my I am. Uh, So, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's, it's, it's easy enough to, to think about democratizing consumption, right? Uh, I mean, right. because the food, food security is about, at the end of the day, democratize, is, is a consumption discussion. Uh, to, to be food secure is, as I say, to be able to consume whether you're in prison or not. You're, the, the, that, that's, a, that's an output uh, on that side. But right. to control food policy and to understand that we need justice in the making of food policy and in the making of, uh, of understanding the architecture of the food system, then all of a sudden we need to be having discussions around things like uh, who controls the seed? Uh, what kind of farming system works well? How do we support farmers? What kinds of interventions okay. make sense? Uh, how do we distribute land? How is it that uh, there's been deep inequality, for example, in the United States around uh, the, the takeover of land and the concentration of power in, uh, in control over land in, in the United States? Uh, and so all of a sudden, if we're having a conversation around food, so food sovereignty or around justice, to be honest, in the, in the United States, we can't really talk about uh, you know, uh, about fairness without addressing the historical injustices that have brought labor to the United States and have stolen land from, uh, from First Nations in the United States, then all of a sudden we do get into the production side of things. But that's what both the, the justice element and the sovereignty element have in common, is that they're looking not just about how it is that you control or, or, or have a say in consumption, but it's about the, the whole arc of not only you know production and how it is that, that we demo democratize, you know, making sure that everyone has access to land and has ac access to uh, good research for agroecology, but also uh, to be thinking about well, so how do we do, how do we think about uh, uh, sovereignty and justice over marketing, for example? I mean, you know, the, the, a lot of what it is that, that we're encouraged to eat today is highly processed food. Uh, there's a, a, a control over the culture of our food system that is controlled by corporations, and democratizing that and reigning justice in over that is equally important. Great. Um, so I want to encourage those who are listening, if they have to ask it now, um, you'll be uh, sort of leaving us in, in about 10, 15 minutes. I want to shift to Sarah. Your, your work with with grads, both the global north, United States, as well as the global south. Some of the things that Raj has been saying in terms of justice and sovereignty, do you see it as global partners? And how so? I mean, give us a sense of the kind of work around food uh, issues and the environment that you're seeing across the globe. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, I, I want to start by just saying it's such a pleasure to be part of this discussion with you, Chamtali, and, and Raj, and Phil. Um, I think the, the questions you're bringing up and, and the experience that you all have on these issues is um, really important, and so I'm humbled to be part of this with you. Um, and I'm glad that there's a broader community that, that's part of this conversation, too. Um, but yeah, to those points, I think, Raj, you gave a really great explanation of the differences between the terms and their evolution. Um, in terms of food sovereignty, um, for folks who are less familiar with La Via Campesina that Raj mentioned, this is the group that really created this concept. 
Um, this is an international movement of over 250 million families that are uh, small-scale farmers, peasants, um, farm workers, fisher folk, small-scale food producers around the world um, in over 70 countries. And that's one of the groups that we partner with um, at Grassroots International. Um, Hello. Yes. Can you hear okay? Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, so um, Go ahead. their work around food sovereignty, I think, um, you know, that that's um, the, the concept really comes from the global south. Um, and it's a concept that has been gaining more traction in the global north as well. Um, and in the U.S. Um, as well, um, and I think you know, food justice for the reasons that Raj described also has a real important meaning here in the U.S. So I think um, where with food sovereignty, there's a clear um, critique of the current economic system, which is capitalism, and a recognition Hello. that we need. Um, hi, Phil. Um, a recognition that we need an alternative economic system. Um, and also recognition of the role of patriarchy um, and the importance of um, um, challenging that and um, uh, building up women's leadership um, for food sovereignty. I think with food justice, um, particularly in the U.S., there's a real important um, role in bringing up racial justice um, for the reasons that Raj described. And so I think you know, in the Global North context, there's a kind of a bringing together of that analysis um, from the Global South and, and from the Global North um, of the particular ways that different forms of oppression have created injustices in the food system and the ways that we have a vision to build something new and different. Um, and I think with, with both concepts, with food sovereignty and food justice, there's a real connection to the environmental issues you're bringing up. Um, so you know, we know that um, industrial agriculture system is a system that is responsible for between 44 to 56 percent of greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. That's something that um, the International Research Institute Grain um, has calculated when we take into account not only the food production and transportation, but also land use change, you know, taking huge swaths of land to plant monocrop corn and soy to feed animals or to feed cars. Um, and when you take into account packaging and, and waste, all those different things, um, it's a huge part of the reason that we're in the climate crisis that we're in. Um, so that's both a, um, a real uh, awakening, a call to, um, you know, help us see why the, the food system is so integrally connected to environmental issues um, and environmental justice issues. And I think it's also the bright side is that, you know, through food sovereignty, food justice, agroecology, we actually have the power to really make huge changes um, to bring environmental justice and climate justice by both building resilience um, so communities, for example, in Haiti that we partner with, the Peasant Movement of Papai, um, they are a group that's also part of Via Campesina that has a clear analysis of how climate change is um, impacting Haitians in a really um, severe way. Um, that's no coincidence that a lot of the communities that are um, experiencing the first and worst impacts of climate change are in the global south, are um, black communities, um, and also other um, communities of color around the world. And their solution is around promoting food sovereignty and agroecology. Um, and they're seeing that as something that um, can, can make them more resilient to climate impacts to come, um, but that can also reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that hopefully the um, the kinds of uh, the level of the crisis won't be as bad as it could be, but it's it's a big fight, and I think you know we're seeing increasing connections between the food sovereignty movements and and uh, climate justice movements, and that's um, I think for me one of the biggest sources of hope. So I'll stop there for now. <laughs> 
Yeah, so thank you guys. Um, I'm in Dhaka for those. And, act, and actually, all of us, I think, are in different uh, states and localities. So uh, for any time, I want to apologize in advance to participants. Um, those who have questions for Raj, please, uh, or Sarah, please uh, function at this stage so that we can uh, pose them to uh, before they uh, leave. But I want to bring in Phil. Phil, uh, can you hear us? I know you're joining us by phone. Um, I wanted to bring you in uh, around how does the GMO debate fit into these conversations around food sovereignty and the environmental movement? Um, what's the piece that the GMO debate and the movement sort of adds to our conversation? Bill, is that... Okay, so I'm going to... Um, I don't know if Bill can hear us because he's um, joining us by phone. But maybe I'll pose the question to either Sarah or Raj around how does the GMO seed preservation, I think Raj talked about it a little bit, I know that some of the global partners that are um, uh, international have been um, mobilizing around um, GMO issues, more so in the global south uh, than I am aware of in Europe. But how does that factor into our conversation? Um, well, the... But people who are unfamiliar with genetically modified organisms ought to know that... Can, can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, okay, good. So, so for, for folk who are um, unfamiliar with what genetically modified organisms are, um, they, I mean, the, the Cliff Notes version is that the, these are plants that are, are largely owned and are propagated by the pesticide industry. They are uh, plants that are either designed to withstand a certain kind of herbicide um, known as glyphosate, uh, or to produce a, a herbicide from, or, or rather produce a pesticide from within the leaves of the plant, um, a, a, a pesticide known as Bt. And uh, depending on the plant, uh, the idea is that, that either it sort of repels a particular kind of, of insect or uh, it's a kind of plant that you, you plant in long, long rows and then you spray this magic herbicide that kills absolutely everything except this one plant. Um, so that already points to the kinds of ways in which genetically modified organisms get used. They are uh, monocultures. They are part of industrial agriculture where you're planting one of everything and long, long rows of commodity crops. Um, and th those major crops are corn, uh, soy, and cotton are the, are the major uh, genetically modified organisms. So there, there, there are others as well. Um, now, what that involves is a concentration of power and a concentration of knowledge in the, the farming system. So it's not just about, uh, a, about one seed company selling you seed year after year after year, which is true, and that's one of the ways in which you know, that, that's part of the business model of industrial agriculture. Um, the, the, the problem runs deeper than that. It's an environmental problem because the uh, the, the, the herbicide that's used, glyphosate, is, uh, has now been you know, basically coming to the end of its, its useful life. Uh, it is, uh, there are more and more weeds that are resistant to it, and uh, we're now moving on to the next in a, in a range of herbicides, going back to something like atrazine, which is incredibly uh, damaging uh, of pesticide, and, and now we're having 2,4-D, a, a, a pesticide that's part of, of, of Agent Orange, now being uh, approved for use in U.S. fields alongside a, a plant that is resistant to it. Um, and, you know, the, the, the sort of arms race of, of pesticides is good for nobody, particularly if it's bad for farm workers, but it's, it's bad for everyone um, to, to have these kinds of uh, chemicals in the environment. But it's, it's also a, an assault on the imagination of how we might grow food differently in, in the future. Um, and, and, I, and I think Sarah's in a, in a great position to talk about how there are lots more farming systems than just industrial monoculture that we can be turning to. And I think what one of the problems with the, the world of GMOs is that they constrain and uh, monopolize uh, our imagination about how it is we might, um, we, we might farm differently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I really appreciate that, Raj. And um, yeah, I think that, that what you brought up in terms of the um, Sorry, Sarah, the do you want of... to um, sort of continue in terms of the work that you're seeing amongst your partners around GMO? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, our partners are definitely experiencing a lot of the threats that are coming from both GMOs and monocultures in general. 
um, the industrial agriculture or a corporate agriculture system, um, and and are you know creating the the um, other forms of agriculture that are healthy for people and the planet. Um, and so yeah, a few examples of both the resistance. Um, one example is in Mexico, um, after over a decade of struggle, and there is continued struggle, um, but there was a big victory a little over a year ago when um, movements were able to, uh, to at least temporarily stop the commercial planting of GMO corn. Um, so that's something that, you know, corn is coming from Mexico, that's the, the origins, and there's such a huge biodiversity of different kinds of corn um, that are, you know, incredibly nutritious, that are adapted to particular regions, that are culturally so significant. In Mexico, people say, you know, without corn, we have no country. Um, we are, we are corn. Um, we are made of corn. And so, you know, you can imagine a corporation coming in and um, saying, you know, what we're going to just uh, propagate this um, genetically modified corn that we control. Farmers don't control the seeds and the, the systems for thousands of years that farmers have used um, to sustain themselves and their communities are under a lot of threat. So both peasant and indigenous movements together, and it's actually I think one of the most inspiring things about this story is that it really brought together movements of peasants and indigenous peoples um, that sometimes have been at odds. Um, a, to see, you know, a kind of a, a common, um, a common vision, a, a common struggle, um, and so there was a court decision that temporarily stopped commercial planting of GMO corn. Um, it's an ongoing struggle, and we'll have to keep on um, working with those movements and and taking action in solidarity with them. Um, but they're they're really courageous uh, in defending their seats. Um, in Guatemala, um, similarly, movements of peasants and indigenous peoples were able to um, uh, prevent passage of what's called a Monsanto law, which would have allowed for more privatization of seed systems. And, um, and you know, what we're seeing in a lot of places around the world is actually criminalization of um, seed sharing. Um, so it's going beyond mm -hmm. just trying to promote the corporate seeds, whether they're GMOs or just hybrids. Um, it's also about saying, you know, the, the systems that peasants and communities and indigenous peoples have used for generations and hundreds and thousands of years um, are, are illegal, are becoming illegal um, to just simply save your, your seeds and, and give them to your neighbor and exchange them. That's becoming illegal. So this is the kinds of threats that we're seeing where corporations are more and more trying to take over just the basic elements of life. Um, that are necessary to have food sovereignty, land, seeds, water. Um, so the resistance coming from the ground up is, is really important. Yeah. And um, Raj, as you mentioned, you know, people are both resisting and they're, they're building, they're creating, they're, um, they're envisioning the, what, what we want um, and, and constructing that. So um, you know, in addition to the example I talked about in Haiti, this is what people are doing around the world. Um, in West Africa, there's a campaign called We Are the Solution. And it's a campaign of rural women's associations in five countries in West Africa, including Burkina Faso, Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Senegal. Um, and these are women who are saying, you know what, the, the Gates Foundation and um, others involved with the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, they're trying to tell us that they have a solution to hunger and to climate change. They're trying to tell us that their package of corporate seeds and pesticides and herbicides and chemical fertilizers are what we need. But we know that's not what we need. We know that we have the solutions from our traditional practices in agriculture and new things that we're learning that combines with, with, with science, with learning from different communities. That's what agroecology is. Um, that includes the biodiverse seeds, that includes water conservation, that includes um, crop rotation, that includes um, working with livestock and compost, um, that it, it, it's really a whole circular system. It includes agroforestry. It's all these different elements. 
and it's locally adapted. Each different place um, has different needs and has different practices that work best in, in that local place. But it's also internationally connected. So, um, you know, people in um, a dry area of Brazil can connect with people who are in a dry area of India. Um, and we had a, actually an exchange last year in Brazil where bringing together people from movements in South Africa, in India, in Brazil, in Mexico um, to share their practices in agroecology. Um, and learn from one another. So I think we're seeing that um, becoming more and more um, wanted, becoming more, you know, people wanting to be able to learn from one another and share their practices and also strategize because a lot of the threats that they're facing are coming from a similar place. And so people can say, oh, well, how did you get this policy in Goiás, in the state of Brazil, where the state actually compensates you for producing your own Creole seeds and sells, um, buys them from you and gives them to other farmers. Um, that that's a, a model that a lot of people were really interested in learning from a group called the Popular Peasant Movement in Brazil. Um, and so I think you know, there's all kinds of examples like that that um, are, are great for us to learn from here in the U.S. and for people to, to share more with. So I just want to give you a chance to say some concluding words. Well, uh, unfortunately, and I, I, I know I, you I, gave I, me a okay. Yeah. Yeah, Bob, but, but I mean, I, I, okay. I just want to endorse absolutely everything that Sarah says. I mean, that, that, <laughs> that the, the joy of agroecology and food sovereignty coming together is that you've got these fantastic systems of growing more food and also governing the way in which that food is distributed so that uh, it's good for everyone who is involved other than the large corporations about which Phil is going to be telling us. Um, but if people want to know more, I think my, my favorite organization that, that I'm, I'm currently encouraging people to look at uh, is, is, I mean, La Via Campesina is fabulous. But if you want to, an interesting example of how to fuse these two things together, of um, agroecology and food sovereignty, there's a terrific organization in Malawi called the Soil, Food, and Healthy Communities Project. Soilandfood.org is the place to look. Um, but thank you so much for having me on, Chomtad. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. So do you want to... Um uh, Bill, um, can you hear us? I hope that we can bring yes, you I into can this now. conversation. Excellent. Okay. So the uh, the connection is um, uh, not great, so uh, I can I can hear, but uh, the um, understanding is is a bit limited. So we're going to have to talk a little bit uh, slowly, I think, unfortunately. Well, why don't you tell us uh, based on your experience around the GMO uh, activism. How does this fit into food sovereignty? And just tell us about your work. I think, um, don't mind the questions. I think we want to hear from you because you have enormous amount of expertise. You've been a drafter with the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. You're a lawyer. Um, so just tell us about your work and the GMO debate and how you've been involved. OK, thanks. That's very generous of you. Given that the um, the quality of the audio is such that it's really hard uh, comprehension is hard, I'm happy to talk about how the notions of food sovereignty, which uh, Raj and Sarah are, are expert on, and I'm sure have led, uh, how Did we, um, Phil, did we lose you? We might have um, lost, and I think Albert Garcia, who is uh, trying to coordinate me and Taka and Texas and Seattle and Sarah, I don't know where you are, whether you're in Boston or in New York. Uh, so while we wait for Phil to come back, I do want to touch back on a couple of issues that uh, talk, which, and I think a little bit from Raj, which is how culture, race, and gender play. You know, I think when we talk about environment, food, oftentimes um, GMOs, since it's such a technical and scientific debate, uh, we forget the ways in which culture and race and gender um, in Bangladesh 
seed preservation is a function mostly for women. So corporate control is not being anti-corporate. It's actually a feminist position because you're displacing women from a key role that they play in society. Oftentimes, the GMO debate is considered to be sort of, you know, we're against corporations and development. So just wondering if you might, while we get um, Bill back on the line, to just maybe tease gender specifically and then culture. And you talked about indigenous cultures, the example about we are the corn, um, examples in terms of South Asia. And I think, unfortunately, um, it seems that we might have lost uh, Bill through the audio. I hope that I'll be able to bring him back uh, in a different uh, segment uh, to share his expertise around the GMO debate. But um, Sarah, why don't we talk about sort of issues of um, gender, and then if you want to, you know, um, also mention uh, a, a little bit of race. I heard that more from Rod in the, in the north, in the global north. Absolutely. Hi, the connection is back again. Um, okay. Shall I continue? Yes, please I'm continue. I'm sorry about and the, then... you know, as I said jokingly earlier on right. to uh, the colleagues, um, our, all of this work depends upon the notion that technologies aren't perfect, and that exists in the biological realm as well as uh, communications right. realm. Good point, right? <laughs> so let me continue. Um, there's nothing wrong with adopting foreign technologies, in, in inherently wrong with it. But in the context, if we look at it, um, this is a kind of new colonialism, if you will. Um, technologies uh, that were uh, developed to um, uh, change the genetic characteristics of, uh, of food crops um, were not really done as any kind of an authentic response to the needs of either uh, farmers in the global south or consumers there. And um, as we know, uh, if we look at some of the examples, historically they have been very clumsy and very often inconsistent with cultural practices and with general mores. Um, so we have a situation uh, such as the Gates Foundation's intervention in all of this. And those of us here in Seattle are particularly concerned about that because uh, we have certain responsibilities being in Gates' hometown to deal with the, uh, the kinds of political favoritism uh, that helps him promote these different schemes of his. So you have a very, very wealthy white man who knows nothing about agriculture, knows nothing about Africa, knows nothing about, or he must know something about food, I presume he eats, basically adopting policies and positions which are going to unbelievably impact farmers and consumers in other cultures, other countries, and so forth. And in addition, very often this work that is being promoted, and it's not just Gates, of course, but he is intimately, and the foundation is intimately tied in with um, uh, the U.S. government and um, uh, the big agricultural firms, Monsanto and so forth, on numerous international commissions, numerous national activities and so forth. This is not a conspiracy paranoia that I'm laying out. This has all been documented and it's the basis on which we do our work. Um, and it's a kind of new colonialism because it's forcing um, uh, ideas that are not authentic or compatible with the cultures and the needs of people in the global south that um, are neat and nifty to a guy who believes that high tech is the solution to all the world's problems. So um, the GMOs uh, in the United States have been totally and are totally unregulated and un, um, uh, there's, there's no oversight. And that was done through U.S. political manipulations, which I could talk about if you want, but I assume that that's not a primary interest to this audience. Anyway, the U.S. and the industry tried to waylay any kind of international attention to this issue. However, uh, because the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was signed in Rio in 1992, 
uh, contained a provision authored by the Malaysian delegation that said that countries should look into whether there is a need for any kind of international oversight of GMOs, and if so, what the modalities of such oversight should be. Um, under that provision, there was a uh, fairly long period in which um, uh, contentious issues were debated, meetings were held, and which um, finally in uh, 1995 at a meeting in Spain represented a, a, a victory. There was a victory by most of the third world countries and uh, civil society groups in a decision that yes, some kind of international regime was necessary. And that led to the negotiations of what became the Cartagena Protocol, seven years of very, very tense negotiations. And um, as, as you know, the protocol um, came into force um, about a dozen years ago um, and has a number of provisions that are rel relevant to the food sovereignty issue and environmental concerns. I'll just give you one example of um, how it's currently being played out. Um, the Cartagena Protocol recognizes the ability of any country to do a risk assessment of a GMO before that GMO is imported into the country. Um, you could say that countries, of course, have this right inherently as they do, but the argument was made that other that under other international legal regimes, particularly the WTO, that right of uh, restricting importation has been um, uh, reduced or restricted. And that's a, fa that's a fair statement. So I'm not taking a position on whether uh, uh, that would have been upheld or not. But at any rate, the Cardena Protocol says, look, um, States have this right. Now, it's very dicey how the interaction between the protocol and the WTO should operate. There are inconsistent provisions in the preamble of the protocol. But nonetheless, there's a whole risk assessment process. Um, a big fight was whether or not social and economic considerations could be taken into account. Now, of course, we want that because we know that uh, the economic, um, uh, the environmental and um, uh, issues can be can be sort of severe. We see that already in in things like the reduction in the the, the, the health of the monarch butterflies and so forth because of the uh, as an indirect impact from the um, the use of herbicides on uh, in corn so that the milkweed uh, weed which feeds the young of the cat uh, the young caterpillars has been substantially reduced and so forth. These are all indirect and what we call higher order effects. So, and the social effects are the ones culturally and so forth that I alluded to and that I'm sure that Raj and Deborah have been talking about. Um, in terms of economic impact, the irony is, as our colleague Vandana Shiva said at these negotiations, his concern about trade and so forth is the economic interest of powerful groups. We would like the consideration to include the economic interests of the less powerful groups, the farmers, for example, in the third world. There is still, even though we got a provision, Article 26, which says that SEC, social and economic considerations and uh, environmental considerations, can be included, um, there is still active current debate about what that means. So the protocol secretariat has a uh, a series of online, quote, expert consultations to deal with issues and come up with uh, documents that will be discussed at the uh, meetings of the parties, which occur every two years. The next one is in Mexico in 2016. And uh, believe it or not, on the, uh, the one dealing with Article 26 that I'm involved in, um, People representing the U.S. government, um, uh, the South African government, um, industry-affiliated scientists are arguing from the beginning that as if we had never had had this argument and, and the conclusion of the protocol language in Article 26, that um, 
Well, uh, the risk assessment shouldn't be, it doesn't have to deal with uh, social and economic considerations. That's a separate and different thing. That's a separate and different thing. Now, the, the language of Article 26 was a compromise, and it says that the country may include SEC. But it doesn't say that it can't include it in the risk assessment, which is designed to determine that whether or not DMO should be allowed in. And the reality is, is that very often indirect effects in any kind of an action are much larger and much more consequential than a direct effect. And um, the whole notion under WTO that um, uh, you can't have restrictions on trade, et cetera, et cetera, is all about the indirect effects of a local uh, regulation that a country might adopt. Nonetheless, they argue this as if it was never discussed, never decided, and um, um, the, 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 the struggle goes on. I mean, there's like no end to it because of the power or of the industry, the power of the Gates Foundation, the power of the U.S. government. The U.S. government has its minions and capitals around the world constantly telling ministries of agriculture there's nothing to worry about, constantly telling parliamentary committees on agriculture and food and health that there's nothing to worry about, et cetera. So in many ways, uh, while the achievement of the protocol was really a great victory, um, and we realized that it was a circumscribed victory. We did not win every argument, for sure. Um, but it was certainly something that the industry did not want to see, and that the U.S. in particular, uh, uh, as well as the Canadian government and now the Argentinian government, et cetera, and the South African government, are not happy with. Um, it is up and functioning, and it is an arena on a contested terrain. Yeah. So um, I, wanna, um, I could continue on other things like no. codex if you wanted, uh, um, but why don't you give me a little feedback on what you'd like me to continue to talk about? Yes. Sure. Well, um, actually, um, it was uh, very. I'm not able to hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, I think we might have lost um, Chamtoli. Can you hear us, Chamtoli? Hi, Chamtoli, are you there? I can hear. I can yeah. hear you now. Sure. Um, so I wanted to mention that we are actually uh, we had uh, slated in five minutes. So I want to be respectful of the time. So I think what we uh, what I'd like to do is. So you've given us an you know, enormous amount in terms of um, your key role in the drafting of the, um, of the protocol and sort of being mindful as to the politics around it. And while there are legal victories, there's a lot of on-the-ground activism that needs to happen. So unfortunately, what I would like to do um, is I would like to have both of you just give thoughts. And if, you, if there are any sort of burning points you want to incorporate, um, and then and uh, invite you both uh, to come back and let's continue this conversation. Because I think that <clears throat> we've just really begun uh, in terms of the definition, but there's a lot uh, to cover. So I think that just in the interest of um, the, those who are listening um, and the participant time, what I would like for both of you to run and, and with Phil, giving him the last word is just briefly, just kind of concluding thoughts. Um, Great. Uh, uh, let me just sort of say, because it really was hardly comprehensible. I'm sorry, the technology is just not working sufficiently. That's From what fine. I understand, you'd like some concluding thoughts, and you talk yes. about um, um, having us come back and do something. I would be yes. happy to do that, and I would be happy to try and arrange my physical location in a different place where I could be involved more directly and uh, and and uh, easily than current situation that we're putting up with now. I feel really badly about it, yeah. um, and uh, yeah. Would be happy to, uh, you know, go to um, an, uh, an office or something at the university yeah. that has stuff set up sufficiently, no. or do something. Uh, no use a colleague's uh, system here so that I could participate yeah. in a more meaningful way. Um, Why don't we get a concluding uh, remark from Sarah, and then a concluding thought from Phil? Why don't we just have Sarah just? Okay. So, cool. Yep. Great. 
Um, yeah, well, maybe I'll just uh, talk about it. I feel like, you know, there's a lot of common threads. Um, one thing I, I did uh, want to bring out more is just what the connections around racial justice are um, around the food justice and food sovereignty with a, a couple of examples. I think internationally, clearly the uh, movements that are facing a lot of the injustices in the food system are in the global south, and that's because of imperialism, which is connected to racism. Um, but also in the U.S., I think there's a real history of um, the way that the food system has oppressed um, black people, Latinos, indigenous peoples. Um, so, you know, of course, the founding of the U.S. taking over indigenous lands, um, the, the actual slavery being a system that it exploited um, horribly um, African peoples and, and African Americans, um, and Latinos being brought here to, to work as farm workers after the um, farming on their own lands in their own countries was devastated by things like free trade. Um, so I think we're seeing a lot of really exciting forms of resistance from those communities in the U.S. I want to just point to that. Um, for example, in Detroit, there's the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, um, which even though they say food security, yeah. they're also really about justice and sovereignty. And they've been taking back lands that um, had been abandoned in Detroit um, when people gave up on Detroit um, and said, you know what, we can build this back for ourselves and we can create community farms and, um, and you know, our own food systems. Um, that's really been a model for a lot of urban agriculture around the country. I know groups in Boston, where we're based, learned from the, what was happening in Detroit and said, hey, we have to bring that back here. We have to take over vacant land in communities of color to be able to grow food for ourselves. Um, so that's, I think, really important and, and is part of a, a resistance to racism. Um, I think there's groups such as um, Community to Community, a farm worker organizing group in Washington State, um, Farm Workers Association of Florida, Border Agricultural Workers Project. These are all organizations that have been organizing farm workers not only to challenge the ways that they're exploited on the job, that they're, you know, have huge health risks from pesticides um, and that they're not getting paid well. But they're also saying, well, what would happen if we controlled our own food production? What if we could create our own uh, both community gardens but also our own collective farms and make decisions about how we produce, what we produce, um, and in a way that's also economically just? I think that's also about racial justice. Um, indigenous communities from the Indigenous Environmental Network, um, a group called Black Mesa Water Coalition in Arizona, just a couple of examples of how indigenous peoples in the U.S. are reclaiming their sovereignty um, with food sovereignty as a part of that. So native seeds and traditional practices around um, water conservation and um, beekeeping and you know, just a whole range of um, methods that are really deeply rooted in indigenous culture and are really important for the health of our food systems and the planet. So we're seeing a lot of inspiration from those communities that are most impacted um, and looking forward to continuing to grow together with them. Great, thanks, Sarah. Okay. Um, really, uh, really appreciate what Sarah said and, uh, of course, support um, uh, the, the the views and the observations that she has been has been making. I'm going to address. Um, you asked me really to focus in on a on a on a narrow segment of the food sovereignty problem, uh, where I have a lot of historical experience um, being involved in these negotiations and so forth. So let me just. Um, while it won't be a kind of comment or riff on what Sarah just said, I hope folks can see this as a kind of complementary a series of issues and observations. And I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to three things that are, uh, that are relevant here. One is what we call biopiracy. Um, uh, the second is uh, the laws and regulations in countries of the global south. And the third is having to do with research on health, safety, environmental 
aspects of GMOs. Okay, the first thing, piracy is a term which may be familiar to folks, but uh, maybe it's not. So let me just say that generally, it has to do with foreigners coming in and claiming control over a genetic resource of a country. And they can do that in very different kinds of ways. Uh, there are historical examples where um, there was a Belgian guy who found a kind of geranium growing in the little tiny uh, nook in, uh, in a valley in Costa Rica and took out all the uh, genetic samples he wanted and then destroyed the patch of geraniums and went back to uh, Belgium and, you know, developed a line of geraniums to be sold in the supermarkets and, uh, in the spring and so forth. That's a very simple um, kind of example. Um, what, what I see biopiracy is, um, you know, an extension of the old colonial um, dynamic in which um, uh, countries north and their, their um, industries, their um, um, protected uh, industries would come into countries in the south and basically get control, well, first under slavery of the human resources and, and of course, then the mineral resources and then the land resources now. And it's sort of like now the genetic resources because I will just remind folks that when it comes to uh, genetic wealth and to biodiversity, all countries are not created equal. And some of the smallest ones, like Costa Rica that I mentioned, and many of the ones in Africa, tropical countries, have huge biodiversity compared to the very, very limited biodiversity in countries like the Scandinavian countries and Canada and so forth. So um, uh, part of the whole trade of the, of the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, is, okay, the North can get limited access under certain terms to the genetic resources of the South, and I hope folks see immediately how this was related to food sovereignty. Uh, but in return, the countries of the South have to get um, benefits. Now, I will say in very general terms that this notion of access and benefit sharing has so far developed to facilitate access and facilitating benefit sharing, not so much, not so much at all. And in addition, the CBD uh, states very clearly that the genetic resources are the property of the state, not of the tribe or the farming village or the local um, people in that particular area that may have been growing and cultivating and nurturing this genetic strain for millennia but no, of the state government. So sometimes biopiracy is now occurring not in the blatant kind of way of the Belgian guy in Eureka, but in um, very subtle, uh, legal kinds of ways, very much removed from the dynamic of, of, of local groups, very much uh, uh, away from any kind of control and even knowledge of, uh, of civil society. And that leads to the second point of changing laws. This is going on right as we speak right now in Uganda, for example. Um, tremendous pressure on the legislature to say, one, that things are safe and have been proven safe in countries like the U.S., which, of course, is false because the U.S. does not do safety testing of GMOs. And, um, and this thing, getting these countries, the South, to change their laws it's just like the old colonial concessions that countries in, in, uh, of the North used to get in countries of the South. Uh, the most obvious example is what happened in China in the, um, in the 19th century. Of course, it's uh, just can stand in for what happened in many, many countries. And so um, falsely claiming uh, knowledge um, and, and pacifying uh, people who are concerned in third world countries in the South about, uh, oh, we're taking care of this and so forth and so on. Um, it's being an entry for these economic interests of the North um, um, to exploit further the resources of the global South. And finally, um, of course, there has been some research showing problems with GMOs. Um, essentially done by independent scientists whose curiosity and 
knowledge of the situation led them to try and amass skimpy resources to do some work and and have come up with showing tremendous problems, um, uh, risks and so forth. And instead of a rational scientific, international scientific uh, project that would say, oh, well, we should see if other labs can replicate this. We should see if we tweak the variables, what happens, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, the scientists have been unbelievably attacked by um, other scientists who with associations with industry, with um, public by publicists, by governments and the like. And we have now a, a roll call, I will call it a roll call of honor of people like our Pod Putsai, uh, Terry Travick, um, uh, Ignacio Chappelle, uh, um, and of course um, um, the, the, lay, the the last the French study uh, uh, showing that possible tumor, okay. possible tumor uh, growth in rats and so forth. And the attacks um, are designed to um, squelch intellectual uh, investigation of this, investigations which would better inform civil society, mm -hmm. consumer groups, farming groups as to what kinds of, of policies would be best to effectuate their own needs and their own interests and so on. So I offer these kinds of these kinds of areas as very specific, maybe technical, maybe legalistic. Okay, I am a lawyer, um, <laughs> but uh, I am too. complementary <laughs> to the important social movements and trends which Sarah and Raj have been talking about. Um, I hope this is helpful uh, um, no, to the folks who are no, it's extremely helpful, and um, you know, one of the uh, challenges of being a moderator is that um, you know, when, just when you're getting good, is when we have to stop. And so, I want to thank um, all of our guests um, that uh, we have began uh, uh, on really topics that deserve their own attention. So, GMO and I'm glad Phil, that you talked about the research and the law. I'm also a lawyer, so I think that, that those pieces are important. The activism, the, the work that's being done globally, and then being able to frame the issues as well in terms of the, I think that what we've done is really begun the conversation. As I mentioned before, I would like to invite um, each of you to come back so that we can Bought the Margins is committed to raising issues around a food sovereignty would like to keep invite each of you to write uh, on the website if uh, you have time. Um, so I think we're going to end there. Uh, if there are a dear with me, and I can put it onto the Facebook page. Um, at this moment, I want to thank uh, Albert Garcia, who is behind this consulting me and Taka Bangladesh. Uh, I think Seattle, Texas, and I forgot where. Sarah is at. Uh, I, I appreciate all the guests and participants for being patient with technology. I think Phil said it earlier, technology is not per perfect. And GMO technology is uh, uh, all sort of uh, based in terms of human. Uh, and so again, I want to thank our, our guests and I hope that we can continue this conversation. So um, take care and I think we're going to sign off uh, today. Tonight here in the Hawkeye, and I guess uh, in the afternoon in the United States. Thanks so much.